The COVID pandemic and the geopolitical developments have resulted in global shocks which have caused widespread disruption, economic instability and significant loss of life. The current geopolitical landscape is witnessing heightened strategic uncertainty. The visit of Prime Minister Kashida comes at an opportune time. With Japan as the chair of G7 and have a crucial and presidency of G20 with the theme Vasudeva Kutumbakam, One Earth, One Family and One Future, will also seek to bring attention to the issues of the Global South. Moreover, as members of G4, India and Japan have a common interest in reformed multilateralism so that the UN bodies, including the UN Security Council, is updated to reflect contemporary realities. Strong ties between India and Japan have benefited not only our two countries, but contributed positively to the wider Indo-Pacific region and the global agenda. With these words, may I now invite His Excellency, uh, uh, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, to deliver the 41st Sapro House Lecture. Please welcome Prime Minister Kashir. ジャイシャンカル、ガミダ寺院、そして新ICWA 皆さんもご存知の通り、自由で開かれたインド太平洋、フォイップは私の尊敬すべき友人でもあります。安倍晋三元総理大臣が提唱されたものであります。2007年に安倍元総理がこの地において太平洋とインド洋を初めて インドはフォイップの始まりの地です。私もまた2015年に外務大臣としてこの地を訪れ、本日と同じ ICWA主催のこの場で講演をいたしました。そしてインド太平洋の時代において日本とインドがともに この地域と世界を牽引していきたいということについて私をいたしました。2016年には安倍元総理が自由で開かれたインド太平洋のビジョンを提唱しました。それから7年国際社会には 新型コロナのパンデミック、ロシアのウクライナ侵略など、パラダイムシフトという出来、大きな出来事がありました。本日、私はホイップのビジョンをさらに発展させ、インド太平洋の未来のために日本がいかに取り組んでいくかについてお話
国際社会が共有すべき考え方を提供したいということです。第二に、FOIP の協力を拡充していくことです。ロシアのウクライナ侵略により、私たちは平和を守るという。Why is it necessary to develop FOIP now? At a time when the international community is at a history's turning point, I would like to clarify the concept of FOIP once again to propose a guiding perspective to be shared by the international community, which, if left unchecked, could drift towards division and confrontation. Second, Japan will expand cooperation for FOIP. Russia's aggression against Ukraine obliges us to face the most fundamental challenge, defending peace. Various challenges related to global commons, such as climate and the environment, global health and cyberspace, have become more serious. I will incorporate these new elements of addressing peace and the global commons related issues into FOIP. Also, I will take further measures in areas such as connectivity and freedom of the seas. That have been the focus of FOIP thus far. As I said to you before, international community is faced at a history's turning point. In international community, there is a big balance of power changes that occurring, shifting dramatically, and this area is one of the area. In my speech in the U.S. in January, I stated that as the so-called global South grows and the world becomes more diverse, we need to have a good understanding of their historical and cultural background, and that the means of sharing responsibility for global governance will become an increasingly important issue. The international community has entered an era in which cooperation and division are intricately intertwined. We are seeing an entanglement of different issues, including geopolitical competition, global challenges such as climate change, and the impact of scientific and technological developments on nations, societies, and individuals. This situation could be described as a compound crisis. In a war like this, the more vulnerable the nation, the greater the sacrifices, and the more they are at the mercy of different issues. One characteristic of this turning point is a lack of a guiding perspective that is acceptable to all about what the international order should be. This was clearly demonstrated by the considerable discrepancies in the attitudes across various countries toward Russia's aggression against Ukraine. I think this is an indication that a strong centrifugal force is working within the international community at the most basic level of a perspective. Thus, with the changing paradigm in international relations and in the current situation where there is no consensus on what should be the underlying perspective for the next era, FOIP is a vision. That is, in fact, gaining in relevance. In this sense, FOIP was a visionary concept. In particular, the concept of FOIP has been flexible in evolving in a way that embraces various voices, along with the growing support and endorsement from the international community. I believe that this vision, nurtured by the voices of different countries, and which can be characterized as our FOIP, 
is becoming more important than ever toward the goal of leading the international community in the direction of cooperation rather than division and confrontation. Even at this turning point, the fundamental concept of FOIP remains the same. It is simple. We will enhance the connectivity of the Indo-Pacific region, foster the region into a place that values freedom, the rule of law, free from force or coercion, and make it prosperous. With this backdrop, we should reaffirm and share the understanding that at the root of the concept of FOIP is defending freedom and the rule of law. In other words, vulnerable countries are in greatest need of law in a state in which the principles of the UN Charter, such as respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity, the personal peaceful resolution of disputes and the non-use of force are upheld, is the important premise on which freedom is enjoyed in the international community. Another equally important principle of FOIP is respect for diversity, inclusiveness, and openness. In other words, we do not exclude anyone, we do not create camps, and we do not impose values. Based on these principles, the approach we should take going forward is rulemaking through dialogue that respect the historical and cultural diversity of each country and equal partnership amongst the nations. I believe these are the new core elements of FOIP. There are various views on what the international order should be, such as unipolar, bipolar, or multipolar. But it is not about poles of a single or multiple major powers. I believe that we should aim for a world where diverse nations coexist and prosper together under the rule of law without falling into geopolitical competition. Furthermore, it is important to adopt an approach Focusing on people being not limited to national level, I believe that the survival, welfare, and life with dignity of individual people are a goal that should be pursued anywhere in the world. A nation prospers when its people prosper. Japan will carry out diplomacy to create conditions necessary to achieve this goal. Our FOIP needs to be undertaken together with various countries and stakeholders. Japan will strengthen coordination with the U.S., Australia, ROK, Canada, Europe, and elsewhere. Of course, India is indispensable. We will expand the networks amongst countries that share the vision, including ASEAN and the Pacific Island countries, the Middle East, Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean, and direct efforts in the spirit of co-creation. That said, we newly set forth the four pillars of cooperation for FOIP that are suited for the history's turning point we face. The first pillar is the principles for peace and rules for prosperity, which is the backbone of FOIP. The people who suffer the most from the erosion of the rule of law in the international community are vulnerable countries and people in vulnerable environment. My question is this. Can we not collectively reaffirm and promote the minimum basic principles that the international community should uphold? And by doing so, can we not build the peace of the international community, which can easily collapse if not attended to? These principles include respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity and opposition to unilateral changes to the status quo by force.
These principles appointed to in the UN Charter should be adhered to in every corner of the world. On this occasion, I reiterate that Japan strongly condemns Russia's aggression against Ukraine and will never recognize it. Prime Minister Modi too expressed to President Putin that today's era is not of war. Japan opposes any unilateral changes to the status quo by force anywhere in the world. Moreover, Japan has extended a helping hand to any country in need. For example, over the past two decades, it has supported the Philippines in its fight against the poverty and terrorism and has helped achieve peace in the Mindanao region. It will continue to proactively support the efforts of each country to build peace and reconstruct itself, including providing assistances to you can based on the ten nets of dialogue and cooperation, and Japan will also provide a support that caters to the needs of women, taking in the pros perspective of women, peace, and security, creating a free, fair, and just economic order that does not force a division is also essential. While maintaining the WTO rules as a foundation, we will promote further efforts such as the CPTPP with countries that have the will and ability to pursue a higher level of uh, liberalization. Further to the degree of uh, liberalization, the renunciation of unilateral changes to the status quo by force and of economic coercion is also an essential condition for building economic relations based on trust. Furthermore, Japan has not forgotten to take vulnerable countries into consideration. Bangladesh, India's neighbor, will soon graduate from being classified as a least developed country. And we have already launched the joint study group on the possibility of an economic partnership agreement with Bangladesh. This also reflects the important FOIP principle of excluding no one. Rulemaking to prevent opaque and unfair development finance is necessary for nations to grow autonomously and sustainably. The failure of a nation has enormous impact on the lives of ordinary people. Japan will promote the implementation of the G20 principles for quality infrastructure investment. It is essential that Sri Lanka state restructuring advances in a fair and transparent manner. Japan will collaborate closely with India and contribute to stability in the South Asian region. There are many excellent Japanese companies that can provide quality infrastructure. We will encourage their overseas operations that excel in providing quality infrastructure, thereby revitalizing both local economies and Japan's economy. The second pillar is addressing challenges in an Indo-Pacific way, which is a new focus of cooperation for FOIP. In this era, the importance of our global commons, including climate and the environment, global health, and cyberspace is dramatically increasing. We will address various challenges related to them in a realistic and practical Indo-Pacific way and expand the cooperation for FOIP, thereby enhancing the resilience and sustainability of each society and achieving an equal partnership among autonomous nations. On climate change, Japan will lead a clean market and cooperation in innovation in order to realize the global green transformation, GX, 
It will promote the Asia Zero Emission Community concept as a regional platform which aims for achieving both decarbonization and economic growth. It will also take advantage of ODA and provide support, including for the introduction of renewable energy in island countries. Regarding food, Russia's aggression against Ukraine has caused the food prices to rise and the stable supply of food around the world is a matter of emergency. We recently decided to provide 50 million U.S. dollars in emergency food aid to support vulnerable countries in Asia, the Middle East and Africa, as well as corn seeds and other assistances to support vulnerable farmers in Ukraine. In addition, Japan has proactively worked on the ASEAN Plus 3 Rice Reserve Initiative. It will continue to develop this visionary mechanism for countries to pool their stockpiles in the event of an emergency. Witnessing how COVID-19 has exacerbated the division and disparity in the international community, we are keenly aware of the necessity to respond to global health issues worldwide. Japan remains committed to achieving universal health coverage. Japan continues to support the ASEAN Center for Public Health Emergencies and Emerging Diseases to become the core of infectious disease control in the Southeast Asian region. The scale and frequency of disasters are becoming more serious due to the effects of climate change and others. To help countries build resilient societies, both in terms of disaster prevention and recovery, Japan will harness its expertise and technology to provide support, including for improving disaster prevention and response capacity. The proliferation of disinformation is a common challenge in all countries that hinders people's uh, political self-determination and threatens the autonomy of nations. With a view to ensuring a free and fair cyberspace, we will hold a workshop or other events this year to expand the knowledge throughout the region on countermeasures against uh, disinformation. The third pillar is a multi-layered connectivity, which is a core element of cooperation for FOIP. No matter how times many may change, our need for economic growth will remain in order to achieve growth. Countries need to stay connected in various aspects. However, the kind of connection that relies solely on one country it could be a breeding ground for political vulnerability. By connecting, we aim for increasing each country's options, help them overcome their vulnerabilities, and pursue economic growth in a way that benefits everyone. Here, I would like to mention three important regions. One is Southeast Asia. The ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific AOIP and FOIP are visions that resonate with each other. Japan will make a new contribution of 100 million U.S. dollars to the Japan ASEAN Integration Fund, being mindful of the ASEAN-Japan Commemorative Summit to be held in Tokyo in December. We will also renew by December uh, the comprehensive Japan ASEAN Connectivity Initiative, uh, which promotes efforts uh, to strengthen both hard and soft connectivity. The next horizon is South Asia, including India. The Northeast India, which is uh, surrounded by land, uh, still has unexploited economic potential. Viewing Bangladesh and other areas to the south as a single economic zone, we will promote the Bay of Bengal, Northeast India industrial value chain concept in cooperation with India and Bangladesh uh, to foster uh, the growth of the entire region. 
and then at the Pacific Islands region. The waters that connect Japan and the Pacific Island countries have no borders. The Pacific Islands region is exposed to many challenges such as rising sea levels due to climate change, infectious diseases such as COVID-19 and natural disasters such as volcanic eruptions. The new Palau International Airport Terminal project supported by Japan is a true example of connectivity in that it has not only vitalized the tourism in the economic sense, but also facilitated the transportation of COVID-19 relief supplies. The undersea cable that is being supported by Japan, the US and Australia will also play an important role in overcoming vulnerabilities. We will further set up our efforts correction. We will further step up our efforts in preparation for the Pacific Islands leaders meeting which Japan will host next year. Of course, countries in the Middle East, Africa, Latin America and other regions are also important partners in realizing FOIP and we will advance cooperation in various areas. I would like to add to FOIP an approach focusing on people being not limited to national level. We will strengthen the knowledge connectivity that focusing on people helps human resource development, creates new innovations and underpins the vitality of the region. We will strengthen various exchange programs such as Genesis and the Asia Kakehashi project and connect the youth who will lead the next generation. Next year, if all goes well, a branch of the University of Tsukuba will open in Malaysia. We will support Japanese universities' expansion overseas and connect knowledge and experience. Recently, ICU services have been provided to ICUs in developing countries remotely by medical experts in Japan. We support such efforts and connect laboratories and the field. In addition, we will connect entrepreneurs and investors through supporting startups in Africa and the Japan ASEAN Women Empowerment Fund. In a post-COVID-19 world, digital connectivity is also increasingly vital. We will promote reliable digital technology, including open RAN, and develop information infrastructure, including submarine cable laying projects. We will also cooperate in the materialization of smart cities utilizing digital technology. We believe that there is a great potential to utilize Japanese technology and India's strength in the IT field, as well as to provide support for infrastructure development through Japanese ODA. The fourth pillar is extending efforts for security and safe use of the sea to the air. FOIP has consistently focused on the sea. The oceans are becoming more important and significant. As we have seen with the aggression against Ukraine, major geopolitical shifts are taking place at the heart of the vast Eurasian continent. One could say it is a tragedy. I want to free the oceans from such geopolitical risks. There is an imperative to protect and nurture the public ocean bounty that we all share. Also, we will work on issues in entire public domain including ensuring safe and stable use of the air. In order to protect the oceans from various risks, I would like to once again call for the three principles of the rule of law at sea that Japan has long advocated, i.e., one, a state should make and clarify their claims based on international law. Second, state should not use force or coercion in trying to drive their claims. And number three, states should seek to settle disputes by peaceful means. This year, 
Japan officially adopted the position that it is permissible to preserve the existing baselines and maritime zones, notwithstanding the regression of coastlines caused by climate change. The law is there to protect the weak. The position mentioned above, by way of the three principles, protects the oceans of the islands region from risks. Further, to protect the free oceans, we will support the strengthening of maritime law enforcement capabilities of each country through human resource development, strengthening cooperation amongst Coast Guard agencies, and joint training with the Coast Guards of other countries. Especially, damages caused by illegal fishing is becoming increasingly serious, including in the Pacific Islands region. Japan is no exception. We will strengthen our efforts to combat so-called IUU fishing. We will also expand our efforts for maritime security. My administration has been working on the joint training between the self-defense forces and each country's armed forces, and the development of legal infrastructure such as the RAA and AXA. The RAAs with Australia and the United Kingdom have been submitted to the current session of the Japanese Diet, while AXA with India is already in operation. A new framework for grant aid to armed forces and other related organizations of like-minded countries has also been established. We look forward to cooperating with India in the future, too. The Maritime Self-Defense Forces is a force for peace that contributes to regional maritime peace and stability. We will promote joint training with India and the United States and goodwill training with ASEAN countries and Pacific Island countries. In addition, it is important to ensure the safe and stable use of the air and to enhance the maritime domain awareness from the air. In order to improve the capacity for grasping situation of the air, we will proactively promote transfer of warning and control radars and human resource development and exchange. It is also important to take advantage of satellites for the maritime domain awareness, and we will promote human resource development and information sharing. Further, we will enhance cooperation amongst aviation authorities to address new technologies, including drones. I've spoken about the four pillars of cooperation for FOIP. In expanding cooperation for FOIP, the key will be to implement an optimal combination of various methods. We will further strengthen diplomatic efforts, including by expanding our ODA in various forms, strategically, strategically, while engaging in a strategic use of it. Uh, from this viewpoint, we will revise uh, the Development Cooperation Charter and set forth guidelines for Japan's ODA for the next 10 years. In this context, we will strengthen coordination amongst agencies that handle ODA and other official flows and launch an offer type cooperation which will enable us to develop and propose attractive plans tailored to development demands while taking advantage of Japan's strengths. We will also introduce a new framework for private capital mobilization type grant aid that will attract investments. This is a new menu to support startups by motivated young people in each country. It will help mobilize private capital which seeks to contribute to economic and social challenges. This is a new attempt to generate synergy effects of public and private funds, and Japan will work together with regional partners that support this idea. In terms of mobilizing private capital, a draft amendment to the JBIC law is under diet deliberation by adding foreign companies that support Japanese companies' supply chains to the loan portfolio. 
and by making it possible to invest in startups with overseas operations, it will encourage private companies to expand in growth areas such as digital and decarbonization while ensuring economic security. Through these efforts, and with the public and private sectors working in tandem, we will respond robustly to the needs of each country. Japan will mobilize a total of more than $75 billion U.S. dollars in public and private funds through private investments, yen loans and other means in the Indo-Pacific region by 2030 in infrastructure, for which there are major demands from each country. Japan will grow together with other countries. Up to this point, I have described Japan's plan to develop a free and open Indo-Pacific. To achieve this, India is an indispensable partner. I believe that Japan and India are in an extremely unique position in the current international relations and further more in the history of the world. India is the largest democracy in the world. I have always viewed with great respect at the way such a huge and diverse country as India has developed a democracy. Japan, for its part, was the first country in Asia to achieve the modernization and embrace democracy. It is fair to say that both countries are naturally receptive to and fully committed to the idea of electing governments through general elections and deciding policies through public debate. Even during the COVID-19 pandemic, there were no voices at all in either Japan or India that said that a totalitarian system of governance would be better. At the same time, both Japan and India have unique historical backgrounds. The people of the two countries humbly acknowledge that there are diverse values, cultures, and histories on this planet, and that fully understanding them is not an easy task. We are the kind of people who understand intuitively that the best way forward is to respect the other party and cooperate through dialogue. It follows that Japan and India have a great responsibility for maintaining and strengthening a free and open international order based on the rule of law. This year, as Japan hosts the G7 presidency and India hosts the G20 presidency, my hope is that through working together with ASEAN and other many countries, we will bring about peace and prosperity to the international community which faces a time of challenges. The vision for achieving this is FOIP, a free and open Indo-Pacific based on the rule of law. I believe that this region will be a place where freedom and the rule of law are valued free from force or coercion. Japan will spare no efforts to cooperate with India for the success of the G20. I am looking forward to welcoming Prime Minister Modi to Hiroshima in May and visiting India again in September. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Excellency. It is now my pleasure to request Mr. Vinay Quatra. Foreign Secretary, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, to give the vote of thanks. Ladies, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. His Excellency Prime Minister Kishida, on behalf of all of us in India, I once again welcome and thank you for your visit to India. Thank you for choosing to deliver 
the 41st Sapru House lecture today. Thank you also for so clearly and candidly articulating your vision for the Indo-Pacific, as also your vision of where you see Japan and India-Japan partnership in the evolving geopolitical context. India-Japan special strategic and global partnership built on shared values and interests has evolved today to encompass practically all areas of human economic endeavor. We are today seeing greater and greater convergence on regional and global issues of significance, with India and Japan holding chairs of two key international groupings, India for G20 and Japan for G7, we have indeed found a unique opportunity to discuss our respective and shared priorities. The fact that you chose to deliver this speech in India is significant not just for our two countries, but it indeed sends an important message to the entire region and the world. It speaks volumes about the strength of India-Japan strategic relations. We in India see our ties with Japan as crucial for fostering peace, prosperity and stability in the Indo-Pacific. Strong partnership with Japan is the cornerstone of India's Act East policy and a centerpiece of our vision in the Indo-Pacific. We hope to continue deepening our existing ties and find new areas of cooperation and partnership with Japan under Japan's renewed vision of the Indo-Pacific. With these words, Excellency, I thank you again for your visionary and insightful lecture today. Best wishes to you for the rest of your stay in India and for your return to Japan and we look forward to welcoming you again in India in September this year. Thank you very much.